<laughs> well, it's our privilege now to open the Word of the Living God and to hear His voice from the pages of Scripture as we open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, if you would please. Ephesians chapter 6, I'd like to draw your attention to the first four verses, 1 through 4. And here the Apostle will address the relationship between children and their parents in a Christian home. And as you know, we've been looking at each member of the family as it's been unfolding in the book of Ephesians. He started with the wife in 522, went to the husband in 525, and now he's coming to the children and parents. Let's read from verse 1 through verse 4 of Ephesians 6. And we will see the duty of each one, duty of the children under the influence and duty of the parents under the influence of the Spirit. Verse 1 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Simple enough, but there's some background that I feel that we should remind ourselves why these commands are here and why they must be commanded. Since the fall of man, Genesis 3, sin has corrupted every part of us. We just went through communion and and the, the, the hope that we have in Christ to be delivered from our sin is because sin has corrupted every part of us. That is, every aspect of our humanity is polluted by indwelling sin. Our minds, our emotions, our will, even our bodies. So that we may, may say that mankind, if we understand it rightly, is totally depraved. Not Every one of us is as bad as we could be, but every one of us is as bad off as we could be because of sin. No one is excluded. No part of us has been excluded from sin's corruption. And this has been our experience since conception. It's inherited from our first parents on down to us at conception. Galatians, I have a pile of verses here I want to remind you. Galatians 5.19 says, The deeds of the flesh, that which is corrupted by sin, the flesh, are evident, which are, he gives this long list you're familiar with, I know, immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy and drunkenness, carousing. Boy, what a crowd to hang out with. Right? Yeah, that, that's us before Christ. He says, and like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice, keyword, such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That same human author, Paul, the apostle, says in Romans 3, 9 and following, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we already have charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, and he goes and quotes the different Old Testament passages to support that premise. There is none righteous, not even one. There is, there is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become useless. There is none who does good. There's not even one. Their throat is an open grave, and with their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. And he ends up finally saying, there's no fear of God before their eyes. The unconverted world being described there. And there's more. Ephesians 2, 1, we know this. But he writes there, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Were dead. Talking about the unconverted in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, according to the, the which is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. King David writes a thousand years before Christ, 
came to this planet. In Psalm 51, 5, he says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in, and in sin my mother conceived me. Now, he's not condemning his mother to, for being particularly sinful. He's just recognizing that at conception, like every one of us, we were conceived in sin, including the king of Israel, David. It is now our nature, talking to the unconverted, right? Who, or better yet, said... This is describing what we are naturally. Not who we are, but what we are naturally. So then our entire being is affected. Our minds, our emotions, our desires, our bodies. Every way you slice this, like an MRI, right? Every, every way you slice this, it's going to say tainted with sin, corrupted with sin, in need of a Savior. Our emotions, our desires, and our bodies, every aspect of us. There's more. John 3, 19 says it like this. This is the judgment that the light has come. Speaking about Jesus Christ in John. The light has come into the world. Men loved, that's affection, emotion, the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. That's our nature. Before Christ changes us, we love the darkness. The sinner's affections are fixed on the darkness. What is the darkness? The darkness is that which is contrary to the light. The, the darkness is this world's system, this world, this fallen world's philosophies, this fallen world's ideologies and desires and goals. That's the darkness. And the fallen man loves the things of the darkness and not the things of God, not the things of Christ. The unregenerate loves sin unrighteousness because we are by nature evil. Maybe not compared one to another, but certainly be compared to our Creator who is perfectly righteous. We are evil. That's the indictment against mankind. Not only have we been corrupted through and through, but we we're enslaved to sin. Sin is shown in Scripture to be an overbearing tyrant, relentless in his pursuit. Romans six seventeen. listen to this. But thanks be to God that, that though you were slaves of sin, past tense, were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart, to that form of teaching to which you were committed, he goes on to say, and having been freed from sin. So he's talking to believers. You were once enslaved to sin. <clears throat> you have been freed from sin. And now it says you became slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, says Paul. And then he says more here in Romans 6. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, he says, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness. To present yourself. It's like, coming, it's, it's like signing up for duty. Here I am, sir. Call on me. I'm ready. Present yourself. Before we were converted, we said that to sin. Sin, I'm here to serve you. I am your indentured servant. I am your slave. And I'm presenting my arms and my eyes and my feet and my hands to your service. Christ comes and radically transforms you. And now you are a slave of God, says Romans 6, a slave of righteousness. And no longer do you present yourself to the tyranny of sin. You present yourself to King Jesus as his servant. Since we are all totally depraved before Christ, enslaved under the tyranny of sin, not only is our relationship with God in a state of room, but so too our relationships horizontally. They can't help but be. It is our fallen disposition to put ourselves first. Like we always say, I love me more than anybody I've ever met. <laughs> That's my problem. That's sin. You know what? So do you. You see? That's our fallen disposition that puts me first over and beyond all others. We don't naturally love others consistently, that we actually hate others consistently. Because the Bible talks about hate being described like loving less than, right? 
I love me more than you. So from Bible words, you, I actually hate you in comparison to me. You see? And that's the result of the fall. The whole world, is it any wonder we haven't imploded and just burned and melted to the ground? It's, it's, it's common grace that has spared us to this very day. Because this is who we are before Christ. And our relationship with other people is further described. Listen to Titus 3.3. 3. For we were once foolish ourselves, he writes, Titus 3.3, 3, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts, all different kinds, and pleasures, spending our life in malice, in envy, hateful, hating one another. That's why he can say in Romans 4.31, or Ephesians 4.31, he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. Let it, that, that's, that's inconsistent for, an uncon, for, for a converted person. Put it away from you. Along with all malice, instead, he says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. You see? So then... So depraved and sinful are we that we must be, think of this, commanded to show compassion on those who suffer. We must be commanded. That's how evil I am. We must be commanded to be merciful. We must be commanded to love one another. We must must be commanded to regard one another as more important than ourselves, Philippians 2. We must be commanded to love God, the one who gives me breath. You don't think I'm evil? I must be commanded to love the one who made me and the one who died for me. I must be commanded to love my neighbor. I must be commanded to love the brethren. Wives must be commanded to love their husbands, and husbands must be commanded to love their wives. In Titus 2, 3, the older women are to teach what's good, and then the next verse 4 says, so that the younger women will love their husbands and love their children. What? They have to be instructed. They have to be commanded to love their husbands and love their children. You don't think fallen man is evil? To the core, we are corrupted so that we're more like Satan than we are like God. That's the impact of the fall, you see. It's fascinating. And coming to our text thinking about our relationships not only with each other this way but husband wife and now we're coming into Ephesians 6 and parents and husband or parents and uh, children children and parents disobedience to parents is characteristic of end times listen to 2 Timothy 3 the apostle Paul writes probably very soon before he lost his head he wrote this to Timothy and 2 Timothy 3, 1, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents in that list, followed by ungrateful, unholy. Fascinating. Romans 1, 28, you know that text, the third time where it says that God gave them over. God abandoned the fallen world to a depraved mind, to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossip, gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, and in that long list, disobedient to parents. That's how evil that is to God. In fact, in the Torah, they were to be stoned to purge the evil from Israel. Wow. That's how corrupt humanity is. That's that's who you and I were before God saved us. That was our nature. I I got more. It's like deer in the headlight out there, Max. They're like, what did I come here for? I thought I was going to get a K-Love pep talk, but hey, it's going to get there. Don't worry, right? (laughs) You got to put the black velvet backdrop put, before you put the diamond on there, <laughs> right? right? Um, and it's good for us, is it not, to remember where we've been brought from, and remember that our neighbors who aren't converted are of this ilk. And why should we expect any different than when they hate you for talking about Jesus? Don't worry about it; you're in good company, right? In addition 
to your nature, to addition to, to be enslaved to sin, there is a devil. And he is real. And he is called the God of this world, among other things. He influences this world, which is said to be under his sway in 1 John 5. He influences the world towards evil, not towards righteousness. He is constantly, incessantly assaulting humanity with his dark philosophies and dark ideologies and false teachings. As he attacks the individuals, he's attacking all of our relationships and none more crucial than the family. Not only husband and wife, but like we said, we're coming into both the children and the parent under the influence of sin and its tyranny and the devil. The family has been in the, and remains in the crosshairs of the enemy. We see signs of it, right? The individuals that make up families, just as we just read, we'll just summarize as full of malice and selfishness, okay? And then from there, we, we see the signs of how Satan and sin has impacted the families with sexual immorality and divorce. Unwanted children and abortion. Unwanted children and neglect and abuse. Children's rights. Parents, no parent consent. Today, children can take a Tylenol in school without their parent knowing, and a child can go to have an abortion without their parent knowing. If that's not bad enough, they can go have surgeries to mutilate themselves. Amen. That's from the devil. And it's from a sinful, wicked heart. The family is under the, and has been since the fall, but we're seeing greater depths of the depravity and greater depths of the evil today that our country has never seen before. The state now is being promoted to take and raise your children so that they can be slaves of the state. Right? Such confusion... Our society is spiraling farther and farther and faster and faster down the pit than ever before. And if you're not careful, you can fall into despair. So the question is, is there any hope? I hope we have a resounding yes. This table is symbolic of the hope for the individuals and for the family. See, the hope is Jesus Christ and the redemption he has accomplished through his atoning death and powerful resurrection. Yes? The only hope for your personal life is Jesus Christ. The only hope for your family is the omnipotent grace of Jesus Christ. As we have seen from Ephesians, in chapter, from the first chapter all the way to where we are, we have seen this. That we were once dead, but now we've been made alive in Christ Jesus. Chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. When we were dead, he made us alive. We have regeneration. There's new life in Christ. It's the life of God implanted in the soul of, the, of mankind. And the result is this eternal life, this Christ-like life. The divine life now invigorates you whom he has saved. Not only are you regenerated, but he has transformed and is transforming you. You're under transformation. 2 Corinthians 5.17, anyone in Christ, they are, will become a new man. They are a new man, indicative for a fact. In Christ Jesus, you have new life and you are indeed a new you. Ephesians 4.24 even says that, putting on the new you, and then he describes what the new you looks like in Ephesians 4.25 all the way to our text. So the, the hope for this individual and the hope for the individuals in families is regeneration, transformation. That is the omnipotent grace of God. And then this, 5.18, commands us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So... The new life who then is, is the new you is being commanded to yield to the third person of the Trinity and be dominated and under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Those people have a chance. <laughs> Those people have hope. That's what he describes in our text. The wives subject to your own husbands. That's because of regeneration, transformation, and the filling of the Holy Spirit. Husbands loving your wives like Christ loves the church is possible and happens when there's a new you who is transformed 
who's dominated under the influence of the Holy Spirit. You see, it's the fruit of the Spirit in your life to make that happen. And then we come to our text here in chapter 6, verse 1, and we break it down simply in this. You got the duty of the children in 1 through 3 and the duty of the parents, just to put it simply. And here you have a Christian family living under the influence of the Holy Spirit for the glory of God. Christianity's come home. He's been talking to individuals, he's been talking about the church, and now he's been focusing since 522 on coming home. The reality of your faith doesn't stop at the door at your house so that you're some kind of tyrant or some kind of um, wicked, evil, sinful person in your home and you go out and pretend to be something else. Paul is saying this is who you are and this is who you are when you come home. Wives subject to your husbands. Husbands love your wives. Children obey you and honor your parents. And parents, don't cause anger, but bring them up in the discipline of the Lord. That's awesome stuff. Isn't that awesome? The world cannot do this the way God describes it because of what we just read about their nature. It's impossible. Well, they might be nice once in a while, right? But they can't consistently overcome their sin. It's only the one who's been transformed, regenerated, and filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, if you look at chapter 6 of Ephesians in verse 1, the duty of the children, children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. We need to just mention and pay attention, children, to whom is he speaking? The, the, the word that's used here for children is not speaking of young children. It's, it's a general term that just speaks of an offspring. How, how, I'm 60 years old, and I am a child of my mama. <laughs> my dad's done gone, but my mom's still around, so I'm a child. I would fit that term, generally speaking, okay? The term, context dictates. But here's the deal. This is not a term that's used primarily for little children. That term is used back in Ephesians 4 and 14, where we're no longer tossed to and fro like children, like babes. This term here is the same term used by John in 1 John. Thursday, home groups would be going through 1 John. And how many times does the apostle call all Christians little children? Children. This is the same term. So this term can be used of all Christians. This term is used of adult children. This term is used of a child in the womb. This term is, is, this term is used of, ch of children at any age because it's only being used to describe someone who is the offspring of another or spiritually offspring, if you will. Timothy is Paul's child. Okay, so then, that same word is used in verse 4 where it says, Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger. It's used back in Ephesians 5.1 where it says, Imitator, Be an imitator of God as beloved children. Same word. In 5.8, it's used there where it says that we are to walk as children of light. Okay? So that same phrase then is what Paul is saying here. Children of, of, who are in this position of under authority. Because remember the context here. Because are we saying that, a, that someone 30 years old needs to be listening to mom and dad? Well, maybe if he's living in the house in the basement, he should be. But the one who's been, who's, who got married and is off? No. Because, see, there's, there's avenues of authority and submission. Who has the authority? Just like government, just like elders, just like any other authority, right? There's avenues and there's boundaries and realms. As you're a little child, your parents have, we'll just say it like this, right? More, more authority, rightfully so. And as you grow, the, a good parent is recognizing your maturity and giving you more rope. Some say to hang yourself, but more to, <laughs> right? More to express your maturity. And while you're in the con safe confines of your home, your parents are watching to see if that freedom they just gave you is too much for you, too little, and they reel you back in. You know, they're observing, they're watching. And under the safe confines of your home, you see? Because the goal of the project, is it not, is to get Junior out. You don't want Junior staying with you for 50 years. My mom said, I love you, but I can't wait for you to go. <laughs> right? And I couldn't wait to go, right? 
Do you know what I'm saying? So children, obey your parents. This, 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 is, this is saying in the, in the situation where a child is under the realm, in, in, under the realm, under the authority of the parent, they are responsible to submit to them in this manner. But once you get married, the two become one, one flesh. Right? It, for this reason, a man shall leave mom and pop and be joined to wifey. And they go start another, another family. That's what he's saying. Okay. Um, let's flesh this out. <laughs> We're okay so far? All right. Um, children, child, offspring, obey your parents in the Lord. The word obey, we need to look at that real quick. Hupakuo, to be under hearing, be, to be under the hearing of this this command here is to be is to be under the hearing of someone in authority. And why I'm saying this, it depends on how many of you read other things and what have you. I was reading other people explaining this text, and they were trying to minimize this word obey and say it wasn't obey. And it's almost I just want to make sure you're not confused by that. Obey means obey. It it has the idea to be under the hearing of authority. In other words, when I talked to my sons when they were like in high school and they didn't move, you know what my next question was? Did you hear me? Because the implication was you must not have because you're not moving. right? I just gave you an order and you're just sitting there. Did you hear me? (laughs) See the implication? I heard you, I listened, and now I go. Right. This is what he's saying here. This word children under the listening, under the hearing of your parents. Listen to some of these passages. Listen to this. Mark 1, 27. They were all amazed so that they debated among themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. Listen now. He commands even the unclean spirits and they what? They obey him. There's our word hupako. The same word that's used here in Ephesians 1. Okay. The evil spirits heard him. They didn't linger and lounge around and drag their feet. They had to go because he commanded, you see. Obviously, they heard him. <laughs> Matthew eight twenty seven. The men were amazed and said, What kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Remember when he said, Be still. They listened, they heard, and they obeyed, you see. Acts 12, 13, this is fascinating. Listen to this, Acts 12, 13. Remember the prayer meeting for Peter while he was in prison? And wrote to the young girl. You remember what she heard? She's praying with all of them and then she hears this. It says in the text here, listen. When he knocked at the door of the gate, the servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Same verb that's found for obey. Isn't that, isn't The knock she heard and it moved her. She came to answer the knock. You see, she listened. She heard it. Children are to be un- who are under the hearing of their parents are to do as the parents say in this relationship, in this situation, in this realm. Okay? Ephesians 6, 5. Look at Ephesians 6, 5. What is the command to the slave? Same verb, hakuo, right? Hupakuo, to be under the hearing. Did slaves have a choice in this first century to obey the master? Ah, hey, I'll get back to you, master, in about two weeks. Did they? That one either. (laughs) That one either, right? So do you see, obey is the right word. (laughs) Obey is a good word. Children, obey. Do what your parents who, have given, who are given the responsibility over you and you are in their realm, in their kingdom, if you will, under their authority, do as they say. Look at those young boys back there. Right, Papa? Amen. Children, obey. That's the command from God. Now remember, this has no age to it. So you could be talking to a 17-year-old boy, 20-year-old girl in the home, Right? It's not going to be the same 
nature of relationship as with a six-year-old because of the immaturity. And she's been in your home all those years. By the time she's 20, Lord willing, you, you've trained her. She's, she's, she's learned some things. And now your relationship is much more almost peer-to-peer -peer in a sense. Not totally. Right? But this is the Christian home. This is the home of the new. The child being commanded here is the new you, regenerated, transformed under the power of the Holy Spirit. That child will obey. Guaranteed, it's the result of the spirit and regeneration. You see, it's the new creature. That child will obey, not perfectly because we still sin. But when the Holy Spirit is dominating, you will obey. It will be evidence of the spirit's work when the child is obeying parents. Notice it says your parents, not someone else's parents, <laughs> not the neighbor's parents, but yours, possessive, your own parents. Child, your responsibility is to your own parents. And notice, in the Lord is a, is a phrase which, which speaks about that the child's obedience is as they obey the Lord. It's, 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 it's in the Lord. It's, it's, it's in the sphere of His Lordship, you see. So in this Christian home, the child under the influence of the Holy Spirit listens and does as parents say, just as they do the Lord Jesus Christ. That makes sense. Why should they obey in verse 1? For this is right. I like that. I'm a simple dude, man. I like black and white. I don't like too many choices. It confuses me. I say, ah, man, I said, you choose. Right? I like two choices. That's it. That's me personally. Right? Don't you love that? This is why you should do this, kids. It's right. <laughs> right? Right to who? Right to God. It's a word for righteousness we get. Okay? This is righteous. And righteous is related to law. The law of God is the, is the, is the precepts of righteousness. The law of God is the expression of righteousness. To, to, to be righteous in this sense is to do that which law requires, God's law, God's word. Why should a child obey their parents as they do to the Lord? It's because it's righteous, because it's right. God is the one who determines this. And he moves on and he goes, okay? If the duty in verse 1 is obey, he's going to flip it on its head in verse 2 and say, along with obedience is honor. So you have action. Obedience is action. Right? If you give me a command, you know that I, you know I heard it because I did it. Right? And the action is obedience. But the heart of the matter is honor. That's attitude. Because I could obey because I have done it to my parents and I have seen my kids do it to me hurt their bottom end when they did but when they did right they obeyed but they didn't show much honor right kicking and screaming all the way out to mow the lawn hey boy come here a minute <laughs> we don't we don't act that way right let me help you with your attitude you see i'll give you an attitude adjustment it's amazing how the heart's affected by the backside yeah um all that's all that scripture right praise god be bold parents your god is behind you Right? That little reprobate that God gave you sometimes needs a little instruction. <laughs> and we'll see that later. Right? Not abuse. Not abuse. I have to say that just because it's a real world. But look at what he says in verse 2. The, the flip side of this, this duty for a, a spirit-filled child is to honor your father and mother. He says, parents, in verse 1... That's not to the neglect of mom, okay? It's, it includes mom, obviously. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. There's debate on that, but let's just say what it says. It's the first commandment. It has a promise directly linked to its obedience. So says the fifth commandment, okay? Um, what does honor mean? Honor means to set aside as valuable, it's to, it's to set aside as a treasure. It's to set aside um, the idea of uh, reverence, deep respect. We're told in Scripture to honor the king, 
We're told in Scripture to honor God. We're told in Scripture to honor our parents. We're told in Scripture to honor the gray head. I kind of like that more and more. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Honor, respect. I was taught that if, if a, a young man came to that door and there was a young lady, the young man didn't wait for the lady to open the door. The, the young man showed honor for the lady and opened the door for the lady. Right? That was honor. That was instilled. I got scars on me that instilled that. <laughs> right? To honor. Honor is an attitude. It, it's a reverence. I'm showing respect. I treasure this person, this position. Sometimes the king does not deserve to be honored, for sure. But I'm still commanded to honor. Yes? So it says here, the duty of this spirit-filled child is to do what parents say, because it's right, and with the heart attitude of treasuring them, because verse 3 lays it out here and says, this is why, this is the promise that God promises to the child who follows this command. In verse 3, so that it may be well with you, that has to do with your, 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 the quality, and you may live long on the land. That speaks of quantity. Interesting. Not only long life in a miserable state, but long life and it's well with you. Wow. That's what it says. Oh, God can't mean it. Well, you can take that up with him. That's what it says. Right? So to help my children... Right? We're going to get to the parents, but children need to keep this in front of, or parents need to keep this in front of children. Here's the pathway to happiness. <laughs> he says, so that it may be well with you, it may be good with you, it may, it may be happy with you, it may be blessed with you, and that that blessed state of being is for a long time on the land. This was originally given to Israel in the fifth commandment, so that the, the Hebrew children were said, you will live in the land of Canaan, Palestine, promised land, Israel, for a long time. He brings it out, broadens it out to the church and so the whole world. So that these Christian children are being said that it is to be well and that you will live long in the land if you do what is said here. If you honor your mother, your father and mother. Fascinating. What about the parents? It, there's, the, the temptation is, I mean, the whole book of Proverbs is a temptation, right, to help us with child. I commend mamas and pops, and, I, and the moms and pops that I know here, this is old hat to you, but keep the book of Proverbs in front of you. It has a lot to say. Not exclusively, but a lot to say. So then, this uh, idea of honoring to respect them. One, one uh, New Testament example, 1 Timothy 5, 4, remember the widow, the instruction to widows. It says, if any widow has children, there's our word, or grandchildren, they must first learn to practice piety in regard to their own family. You can see it's offspring, older, to make some return to their parents, for this is acceptable in the sight of God. So to honor there would be to take care of the, el the, 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 the aged parents, right, with finances, uh, whatever was needed by the aged parents. That's part of piety is to take care of them. But my point is that's how they would honor. You would show honor that way. So then, the parents in verse 4, fathers, he starts with a negative command. Now the parents here, the, the fathers would include the mothers. Okay? It's not excluding the mothers, but it is focusing on fathers because they are the primary disciplinarians of the home. They are the head of the home. This is their primary responsibility, not exclusively, but he does mention fathers. Fathers, parents, you could put, you could slash in there mothers. Fathers, mothers, parents, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, you're being commanded to do not provoke your children. Interesting there that the do not provoke your children to anger is probably better translated stop provoking your children to anger because it's a present tense with a negative, so it's negating an ongoing activity that was happening. 
Okay, so it's not saying don't start this. It's saying stop. It's already been happening. Okay, which is interesting because he can say this in such a general way that every one of us here who are papas and mamas, this applies. It must be my natural tendency that must be overcome by the Spirit of God. Right? Apart from the Spirit of God, I'm pretty overbearing, as you could probably imagine. Right? Without the Spirit of God, I'm pretty overbearing and provoking. This is why it's a negative command. He starts there. He says, Papas. Now, isn't it interesting? Because the Papas are the domineering person of the family, especially when the little kids are this big. You know, I'm the dominating figure. I, I, and we like to pull our rank, right? Um, you know, if you don't listen to me, maybe, you know, maybe I'll give you a reason to listen to me type of thing, right? And I had three boys, so uh, that's, I don't, girls are different. I don't, you have girls, I'll have to listen to you. Um, but boys, you know, we, uh, we treated them differently. <laughs> um, but fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Provoke is to, is to twist, it is to push, it is to stir. Stir them to wrath. Right? How do we provoke? There could be a hundred different answers, and yours might be somewhat different than mine, but there might be some bleed over. Here's some suggestions um, that I've thought through over the years. Like I just mentioned, being overbearing. I can provoke to anger by being overbearing excessive in my demands, just, just excessive, overbearing, excessively nagging instead of, I'll tell you once, I might tell you a second, but after that, I'm not going to tell you verbally, <laughs> right? That produces anger because you're just constantly nagging and you're not getting anything done instead of quickly Disciplining, correcting, and moving on. What, what can provoke? How about no love? How about no praise? Parents can be pretty hard because they want their kids to be good. You know, it's something. And we think that we're the, we're the main pushers of it. You know? I'm like a spur on the, on the cowboy's boot, I think. Without the spur, the horse ain't going. So I think that's my job. And so you're constantly just gigging. You're constantly, come on, let's go. That's good, but let's go better. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. And never praise. Never praise. Be careful, parent. Be careful. When you push your kids, it's good to push them, but be careful. You know? Don't do it excessively, but always have praise included. Right? The Apostle Paul is a great pattern. He would, re he would exhort, but like 1 Thessalonians 4, you know, but excel still more. He would, he would recognize the effort, and he would recognize the Thessalonians. Hey, you're doing this. Good job, but, you know, still excel more. Keep going. Don't, don't accept being mediocre. Push on, right? But do it in such a way with, with full of praise, full, full of uh, adoration, you know? And as the child grows, think of this. How can, I, how can I provoke to anger? As the child grows in maturity, but I don't, as far as how I treat them, you know? I mean, I've, I've seen parents who take out the rod and smack their 15-year-old son like they did when he was eight. I don't think that's good. There's other ways to deal with a 15-year-old, right? He might get bigger than you anyway, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, treat them like adults. Treat them with respect as they get older. Right? Show them that you trust them. And when they fail, show grace. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Be merciful. Be gracious. Yeah? Be gracious. Treat them like God treats you. <laughs> does God mistreat you? If he does, it's not the God of the Bible. It might be little g God who's masquerading and he's fooled you. But the God of the Bible is so massive in mercy and grace. Even when he corrects me, 
it's not out of anger and wrath, right? It isn't Hebrews 12, quoting Proverbs 3, tell us that he only does that to whom he loves? You see? So it's loving. So how do I provoke? By, by those things that I just mentioned, and you could add your list to that as well. But I need to move on because I have a time limit. <laughs> um, fathers, don't provoke. So stop provoking your children to anger. But in contrast, now here's the positive, okay? While we're stopping provoking, we are constantly, and this is a present tense command, we are constantly bringing them up in the discipline of the Lord. What a great word to bring up. It's also used in 529. Notice what it says in 529 of Ephesians. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. The word nourish is the same word that's used to bring them up. Okay? Same exact word. So the husband-wife section, the husband is to provide that which nourishes his wife in every area that's hers. Not just physical, but every area of nourishment to bring her up. You bring that same word into the father's responsibility to the children. He is to provide all that the children need, physical, spiritual, um, to, to grow. To bring them up, to nourish them, to rear them up. And notice it's, it's in the discipline, in the discipline of the Lord. The word discipline is a fascinating word. Listen, I'm a word. I, words capture me. Um, this is a word where it speaks of little kids. It's padaya. It's, 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 the whole, it's, it's translated in other places to nurture. It, it's, it's, a, it's a word for, uh, what, where, do you, where does the mamas take their babies, the doctor called? Um, say that one. That one. That's where this word comes from. And so the whole training and education of children, the dis this word discipline is under this, means this. The whole training and education of children, which relates to the cultivation of mind and morals and employs, uses, for this purpose, sometimes commands, sometimes admonitions, sometimes reproof and punishment. Okay? All of that is entailed. Right? Um, it, 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 is, it is our main work at home, in, in, in bringing up these, these little jewels from heaven. <laughs> but look again where it says here in verse, in verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke, but bring them up in the discipline, okay? And then I skip over, of the Lord, because both discipline and instruction is of the Lord. The discipline of the Lord. Of the Lord means belonging to Him or coming from Him or as He says. It's to do this bringing up in the discipline as God says. And where are we going to see that? But in the Bible, right? He instructs how we bring up these children in this manner. And then the next word there is, verse 4 is instruction of the Lord. Bring them up, nourish them in the instruction of the Lord. This word instruction, it, it means exhortations, translated admonition. It has an idea of warning in it, to warn, to admonish. Uh, trench is an, is an old word, uh, lexicon person from the 1800s. He says of this word, it is a training by word. This instruction is a training by word, by the word of encouragement, what then is sufficient, but also by that of reproof, blame, rebuke, or reproof. Where these may be required, this is, this is, in, compare, this is in cahoots, this is parallel with this idea of discipline and instruction. Okay? To instruct means to place it in the mind. What a fascinating picture. It's to take this instruction and place it in your mind by teaching you, by living it out as a pattern for you. And if, and if, other, and if you need a little swift kick in the behind, that way too. All those together is to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You see, because it's all governed out of love, right? It's all governed out of love. 
So then the parents' duty is to teach them about God and how to live for God. That's what we're doing. It, 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 it's instructing in the right way, while at the same time it's warning and correcting from the wrong way. You see? And this is a constant effort, con- constant observation, constantly overseeing. That's why it takes mama and papa to do it well. Right? Listen to Proverbs 13, 24. He who withholds his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. I like the word diligently, right? It's a constant oversight. It's not, and it's not a nagging, and it's not, it's not an excessive, but it is that those children take up your attention, right? And the rod is for correcting Used in the right way, it's godly discipline, you see. Can I add this just because people accuse me of all kinds of things? Maybe not in here, but out there they will. Um, When you do use the rod of discipline, because it is needed at times, don't abandon your kid. Come up alongside them and reestablish your affection and adoration for them and your love for them. So that they know that this, that you're doing this because you're a follower of God and that God says this as much as it hurts to do this and you're, you're faithful to do it and you just reestablish your love for them. Right? That's, I think that's key, key, key. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother. Proverbs 29, 15 because remember what we read about the unconverted heart? If you leave that heart alone, what, what fruit do you think it's going to bear? Right? The crop of an unconverted heart is kind of seedy. Not real good. Proverbs 6, 20, and I'm almost done. My son, observe the commandment of your father. Do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Bind them continually on your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you walk about, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will talk to you. When the commandment is a lamp and the teaching is light, listen now, and reproofs for discipline are the way of life. In other words, reproof and rebuke from the word is a light and that leads, that's a pathway that leads to life. You're showing your kid the way of life and it's God's life couple more. 2 Timothy 3.15 is an example. Young Timothy was raised by his grandmother um, and mother who taught them the, him the faith. 2 Timothy 3.15 says in that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, the scriptures, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And then he says, all scripture is inspired by God. God breathed and profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. The very thing that we just read about discipline and instruction is accomplished through the word of God. You see? So that should encourage us. And maybe us here, we know these things. But you probably have young parents in in your sphere who don't know these things. What a great opportunity for, for, for gospel outreach, for, for, sh- for shedding the light of God in, into... Because one thing for sure, does, aren't parents looking for ways to survive this thing and how to, how to raise up a child, right? We have the answers. We have the answers. Deuteronomy 6 These words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart and you shall teach them diligently to your sons. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. It's our conversation. This because it's who we are. We're Christians. New you, new life, indwelt, influenced by the Spirit. This is what we are doing. This is what we will be doing. So then I add this, and just the final thoughts here about bringing them up in the instruction, the discipline and instruction of the Lord. 
share your love for Christ with your children. Sounds like, yeah, no-brainer. But I think, I think parents forget. Don't think about it. To share your love for Christ with your children. Right? Tell them how much He means to you. You see? And how much His Word means to you. And to follow it in front of them faithfully. Trusting Him. You see? And speak of Him to them often. And, and I hope you understand. More than just verse that says this and verse that says this. That's almost cold. How about, how about the true affection in your heart? You know? I think Paul's word to the Corinthians fits here. It did for me anyway um, when I was studying this. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Come on, children, let's go to the park. And let's go as Christians. <laughs> you know? Read with them. Pray with them. Pray for them. Live by the word with them. How about this too? I only got a few more. <laughs> Live the gospel out before them. Not just Proverbs. Proverbs is great. But the gospel... Seek their forgiveness when you sin against them. Because that will show the reality of your faith. Because you're the one in charge. And for you to bow the knee and come down to their level and seek their forgiveness because you sinned against them. Tell them of God's love for them on the cross. And then I finished with this. I don't think you'll ever... Uh, if you look back on your life as your children get older, I don't think you'll ever regret telling your child how much you love them. Often. Tell them often. Tell them daily. I love you. Get the real good. How about this? I used to say this to my Joshi. I'm glad you're my kid. I'm glad you're my kid. Right? I thank God for you. I thank God for you. Right? So then, t my final statement is to, on all of this, forgive me. Do your part and then trust God. And if he takes your child in means that you didn't expect, he has the right to. He has the right to. Because he's God. So then, so far in Ephesians, the new person under the influence of the Spirit is evidenced in verse 19, singing with joy. Verse 20, giving thanks for all things to God. Verse 21, submit, mutual submission one to another in the church. Verse 22, wives submitting to husbands. In verse 25, husbands loving like Christ Jesus. In chapter 6, 1 through 3, children who obey and honor their parents. In 6, 4, fathers, parents who do not provoke but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And all of that is possible because of what Christ accomplished. Amen? I'll tell you one thing. This world needs Christian families to stand up and be bold for Christ Jesus. Look the devil in the eye and tell him we ain't backing down. Right? Stand down, devil. We come in the name of Jesus right, to dispel the darkness. It's good stuff. We should pray. You have a song afterward? Okay, let's pray. Uh, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your forgiveness of our sins. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your family, the family that you've granted us. No matter where we are with our children, Father, I, help, I pray that you will help us to love and to show Christ. 
and to take every opportunity to do so. Help us to be humble, humble servants for their good and your glory. We give you the praise, Lord, for you are worthy in Jesus' name. Amen.